So this video is leading on from my previous video showing you how I make comparisons with my carbons or active material for supercapacitors. And someone in that video uh, asked me how does my sugar foam carbon shown here compare to that of, of the coconut activated carbon uh, which is used in commercially available supercapacitors. So in this video I'm going to demonstrate you how it does compare. Now this is a tub of activated coconut carbon that I bought uh, off eBay and I I think this is a good benchmark carbon that uh, you can use this carbon as your benchmark to compare other carbons with. So I've done exactly the same thing as uh, what I did with the sugar foam carbon, putting 20 mils of water in this tester pot uh, with 0.1 of a gram of the activated carbon with a couple of drops of polyvinyl alcohol. Give that a little mix and pipette it out uh, one mil onto the graph hole here. Again, about three square centimeters. Now, just from visually looking at it, you can see that the activated carbon uh, hasn't covered uh, the graph hole quite as well as my sugar foam carbon. If we have a closer look and a comparison uh, at the two carbons here, you see the activated carbon on the right hand side and my sugar foam carbon electrodes on the left hand side and you can tell that the sugar foam carbon has got smaller particles so it will press down thinner uh, and gives a better coverage uh, of the uh, of the graph hole so that probably gives you an indication that it's got more surface area than the coconut activated carbon okay so we're going to make a symmetric super capacitor exactly the same setup uh, with my best carbon uh, this is obviously the coconut activated carbon uh, exactly the same setup, we uh, same separator paper, the same electrolyte, sodium sulfate, one molar solution, uh, wetting the separator, put that over the top, the other one straight over the top of it, like so, put another uh, microscope slide over the top, put the clips in place, we'll uh, charge it to the same amount of time, probably five or ten minutes, somewhere around there. Quite often you find that um, the majority of the charge will happen in the first few seconds, but just that last little bit, just as the, it, it, um, you can just make it last a bit longer that last bit of charge, last bit of capacity, give it you know, five or ten minutes to charge up basically. And uh, so we allow that um, electrolyte to soak in, same amount of sort of time to allow that electrolyte to soak in and uh, then we'll charge it up. So this is my power supply here, we we'll use to charge it up. It says 1.5 volts but it's actually 1.6 if you uh, check it on the on the voltmeter. This is the current draw and uh, just by watching the current draw and how it charges up can give you a good idea as to how your carbon is going to uh, perform and uh, can help you to make comparisons. So let's give it a charge up. And as you can see there, it charged uh, at 160 milliamp draw to start with, uh, compared to the 350 milliamps draw that we had uh, with my sugar foam carbon in the previous video. So let's uh, have a little look at uh, the discharge now. And uh, I did a split screen. On the left hand side is the coconut activated carbon. On the right hand side is my sugar foam carbon I showed you in the previous video. And uh, it gets uh, the the motor stops at about 0.1 of a volt. Let's show a, a, a replay of this in slow mo. I know it's quite difficult to tell, but uh, the coconut activated carbon lasted about six seconds, and my sugar foam carbon lasted about eight seconds. But the uh, sugar carbon uh, lasted uh, not only two seconds longer, but the numbers are much higher as well. Many thanks for those that recommended me buying this uh, device, the ZKE Tech and a bit of kits which uh, was in my in the back of my mind but thanks for those bringing it to the forefront of our mind because it does make it easier uh, to test your cells with and make comparisons with the carbons and give you a more uh, accurate reading of the uh, energy density so of course you have the bit of software that you have to download with it as well and this is the results of free carbons that i tested the uh, coconut activated carbon uh, lasted uh, 20 seconds. Uh, the kitchen towel was the, the second blue line along, uh, which lasted about 25 seconds. And then the sugar foam carbon, which uh, lasted 34 seconds. 
Now I had to do some calculations here to work out the watt hours per kilogram. These are the results of that. So as you can see, the sugar foam carbon gave uh, just over a third more energy density, in fact, over the coconut activated carbon. Now, unfortunately, the software didn't make this calculation for me. That's because the device uh, was uh, too small. Uh, you need to, the device needs to produce uh, about one milliwatt hours before it can make the watt hour per kilogram uh, calculation for you. So this is the equation I used to work out the watt hours per kilogram of my carbon that I made out of sugar that I showed you in the previous videos. So first of all, you've got to work out the amp hour per kilogram. So we start off with uh, how many milliamps, and you can see on the uh, on the graph that I showed you um, that uh, it uh, equated to uh, 10 milliamps, of course, because that's where we set the software to. So it was through the, uh, the 34 seconds that it was running, it was always producing that 10 milliamps. So what we do is we time the, um, the milliamps, the current, by the seconds, 34 seconds, and we get a total of 340. Then what you do is you divide that by uh, the number of seconds in one hour is 3,600. Uh, 3, so divide that by uh, 3,600 and we get a total of 0 0.094 milliamp hours is how much that small device produces. So what we then do is we bring in the weight of the active material. Uh, we know that so there was five milligrams there of the active material, so per gram uh, you would times it by 200 uh, to get it up to one gram, of course. So 200 times 0.094 equals 18.8 milliamp hours per gram. So uh, to turn that into kilograms, of course you just times by thousands because it's a thousand grams in a kilogram. And it equates to uh, 18,800 milliamp hours. So we just make it go up into amp hours. So 18.8 amp hours per kilogram. Then what you do is you uh, times the um, amp hours per kilogram. You times it by the average voltage. In this case, it was 0 0.97 volts. So uh, we times that by the 18.8. And it gives us 18.236 watt hours per kilogram. So I thought I'd uh, have a little discussion about what all of that uh, means in just a moment. But I just wanted to clarify a couple of things from uh, the previous video and this video as well. You may notice that uh, with the electronic load at 10 milliamps uh, with the software and hardware, um, that I was charging it at a higher voltage, 1.8 volts to what I had done in the previous video. And I think the main reason for this uh, was that um, I think I might have mentioned in the previous video that my uh, cells started to uh, fail after about 10 charges and discharges. And I wanted to clarify exactly what I meant by that uh, was that the, the, the cell didn't actually fail. It did carry on working. Um, but it, after so many cycles, it started to lose its effectiveness. It started to lose its ability uh, to store um, energy. And I think the reason for that was the electronic load, that I used electric motor, which was too much for such a small cell with such a small amount of active material. Um, and I think um, that that was the reason why um, the cell would fail, or sorry, would reduce its effect effectiveness after so many cycles. Also, I think it was also the reason why we got a very modest 7 watt hour per kilogram uh, measurement um, with uh, that device um, and that having the uh, the 10 milliamp constant load actually enabled me to get a higher reading of uh, as you just saw over 18 watt hour per kilogram now i still think that's still quite modest i think we can get more out of uh, the carbon because i think there's more surface area there um, than uh, than it's shirt than it shows there so I think one of the problems with the sugar foam carbon is that it is considered quite a soft carbon, a graphene-like carbon. And I think the fact that I think its structure can be altered by having too great a load on it, for instance, um, and I think the fact that it um, is not enabling the, the structure of it, is not enabling um, the electrolyte and the ions to, to make the most of the surface area that's available there. 
Now, maybe the solution would be to have a better binder system. It might be that um, we need to mix it with harder carbons, which is what I talked about in the previous video. Harder carbons um, using hemp or cellulose or other cellulose type structures um, that will be considered harder carbons. Um, that will act like a scaffold, if you like, uh, for the graphene type carbon and enable um, uh, the, the electrolyte and the ions to be able to get in and out again and have a better transport uh, transportation in the charging and discharging. And that's effectively what you want from a structured carbon for, uh, for an energy storage device. Uh, but I think the main point of this video and the previous video was just about how you make comparisons between carbons and active materials. You don't actually need an electronic load um, to be able to make um, basic rough um, comparisons. Um, for instance, you could just tell um, how your carbon's probably going to be just from charging it up, just seeing the current draw. Uh, on your power supply, for instance. For example, I uh, tested, um, uh, I managed to get a two kilogram tub of recycled carbon fiber chopped into, I think, uh, six micrometers in length, each um, tiny bit. And this was terrible as a energy storage device because um, it only, you could tell from just from charging it up, it only drawed about 30 or 40 milliamps for a split second. And only discharge for the motor for barely half a second. It was it was awful. Um, after putting it in the in the kiln and I activated it, it did improve drastically, but nowhere near as good as activated coconut carbon, for instance. So um, the whole idea is just about keeping um, everything else the same and the same um, amount uh, of the weight of active material, the same weight of active material, so that you can make uh, those sort of basic general ideas of how each carbon's going to, to go. You'll come across making some carbons and they just perform terribly and you can just disregard them. Um, but of course, having the ZKE Tech um, constant load, electronic load, does make comparisons a lot easier. It gives you a lot more information about what's going on with the cell. The uh, the discharge curve, of course, um, is ob obviously uh, the battery type of discharge curve is a lot different to a supercapacitor, uh, for instance. So it it uh, certainly tells you a lot more. But as I say, it's not essential when you're just making making basic um, uh, comparisons with um, different carbons. Um, so what does all this mean then? Um, the fact that obviously my sugar foam carbon, uh, I'm pretty certain, has a higher energy density uh, than the um, the standard, if you like, or the, the benchmark of a coconut activated carbon. Um, but it's not all about the weight of the active material. Uh, there are lots of other different parameters that makes a good energy storage device. Now, my preference was to, um, in what makes a good active material and a good carbon, is the weight of it. It's one of the main parameters, if you like, um, that most people are interested in when it comes to energy storage devices. Uh, for instance, this uh, lithium-ion battery, it's a spare battery for my phone. It has 12.4 uh, watt hours of energy stored on there. And I actually weighed this at uh, 52 grams and it uh, works out uh, at uh, 238 watt hours per kilogram. But that is the weight of the whole device. This is another important thing to point out. Uh, the difference between the weight of the active material and the weight of a whole device. When you're comparing different uh, active materials, it's important to um, keep to the weight of the active material, uh, not worry about all the non active, weighing the non active uh, ingredients. When you're comparing devices from this battery, from another battery, it's you weigh the whole device, so you weigh the non active uh, ingredients as well. It's all part of the, uh, all part of the calculation. 
Uh, but when you're weighing the active materials, uh, when you're making comparisons, it's best to keep just to the weight of the active uh, material to get the, the energy density. Obviously, I know that the 18, over 18 watt hour per kilogram sugar carbon foam, once we include the weight of the rest of the device, uh, that number is going to be a lot lower, isn't it? Um, but it's not too bad when you consider it's a symmetric supercrust, uh, 1.8 volts accurate electrolyte, etc. Um, but with um, when you're actually when I actually uh, talk about the weight of active material, when you're um, experimenting with asymmetric supercapacitors using metals, uh, it's important that you weigh that is that you weigh that as well. Uh, for instance, if you're making a, a battery type of device where you might have manganese dioxide in one electrode and you're just using uh, a plate of uh, zinc, for instance, as an electrode on the other side, um, you have to weigh the part of the zinc uh, that's being used in the actual cell, not the bit that's sticking out that you're just using as a uh, as a connector. You're just you've got to weigh the amount that's actually involved in the electrochemical reaction because that is active. Um, so it's important to include the weight of those um, as well. Um, but you may not even care about this. You may not even be too bothered about energy density and the weight of the active material. There are other important um, parameters uh, that uh, that they make a good energy storage device. It might be that it uh, you might have this big, huge energy storage device, but if it's easy to make and it's using um, cheap materials, it's environmentally friendly and it's got uh, great um, it's great uh, lots of charges and discharges. Energy cycle uh, cycle life is excellent. Then great. You may not it might not even matter how big or how much it weighs. Uh, for instance, um, obviously with supercapacitors, it's the, the surface area and the the volume of active material is important as well, not just the weight of it. So um, there's lots of different parameters to look at. Um, obviously, self discharge is important in an energy storage device. So it's a particular problem with um, supercapacitors, for instance. Um, there are so many different parameters um, when it comes to what makes a good device. Obviously, lithium iron is one of the, the most popular. You could say it's the best at the moment, but there's no there's no such thing as the best, really, because with lithium iron, there's, uh, it's not particularly great for the environment. It's quite expensive. And uh, its cycle life is not actually that great. Um, so there's, uh, there's lots of different things, but obviously energy density is one of the main uh, parameters that people look for um, that are important for an energy storage device and it's just f for me um, being able to know where I am and making comparisons with carbons uh, the weight of the active material and the energy density is for me quite in, you know uh, the, the most important um, thing that I'm looking for um, so I hope that's cleared a few things up and um, I hope you've learned something uh, from this and um, I hope to uh, hopefully make some more videos and uh, towards making my own device. I'm going to be working on uh, current collectors, um, hopefully making a better carbon, maybe making a better structured carbon than what I've already got. Uh, trying different electrolytes and um, different separators, etc, etc. Um, so I hope to speak to you again in the future.